Thank you, Simon, so much for that introduction. It's pretty humbling to share this virtual platform with Ruben, um, whose chemistry is chemistry that makes me jealous in a really wonderful way. Nevertheless, it's my turn to tell you about the chemistry that I love. So what I'm gonna tell you about today is really one story. It's the story of how our group has developed a platform to take alcohol analogs and replace the gamma CH bond with a bond to another atom. In this case, I'm just showing on the screen chlorination, but you can imagine installing a variety of groups and we'll talk about that. Our lab also has interest in amine-directed reactions or amine surrogate-directed reactions. Unfortunately, there won't be enough time to talk about those today. So why do we care about alcohols and amines? They're ideal direction groups because they're ubiquitous and we're opportunistic. Why do we care about gamma functionalization? Well, it turns out there's no general approach to gamma functionalization. And so we thought we could come up with one because we feel that this is a position that's worthy of functionalization. At least there's no general approach when it comes to thinking about alcohol guided processes. And there are very few approaches when you're thinking about amine guided processes. The challenge is one that Ruben basically just went over. It's that the CH bond you're trying to functionalize is stereoelectronically similar to other bonds that are around it. It's strong, 98 kilocalories per mole. It's not acidic, so you can't just take a base and go in and deprotonate. And it's not adjacent to a pi system. So if you have a pi system, you can't just take a metal that's pyphilic and then use that to direct the process. So it's challenging. Of course, we're not the only ones interested in this challenge. If you look in the literature, there are a couple of great examples from this past year, um, year or two. Examples from Jin Kwan Yu's lab and Vlad Gavorgian's lab. Um, and there's even a CCHF virtual symposium that uh, John Hartwig used to highlight his work in terms of uh, gamma functionalization. So I encourage you to check out that earlier symposium at some point in time. The reason that we all care about this issue is basically the premise of the CH Functionalization Center. CH Functionalization is valuable. Small structural changes can have a dramatic impact on biological activity. So for example, 6-deoxyerythronolide B, this molecule here, shows no detectable antibiotic activity. But as soon as enzymes install these two alcohols, suddenly the first detectable antibiotic activity is achieved in an erythromycin precursor, biosynthetically speaking. The community has a grand goal. The grand goal is to be able to take molecules as complex as this and at will replace any carbon hydrogen bond in that molecule. And we're basically contributing to this grand goal. And we're contributing to it with a focus on gamma functionalization, as I mentioned earlier. When we started thinking about gamma functionalization, we had this idea that you effectively want to take technologies that are out there and shift them one position over so that you can steal from these technologies um, and build upon them. And so we were aware of a resurgence of interest in the hoffman loeffler freitag reaction, a reaction that's been around for the last 136 years, where you take a precursor to a nitrogen-centered radical, in this case, just an N-chlorinated compound, activate it, in this case with light, to generate a nitrogen-centered radical. That nitrogen-centered radical is poised to go through a six-membered ring transition state, carrying out CH abstraction and forming a carbon-centered radical. And that carbon-centered radical is poised to trap an atom. In this case, just trapping a chlorine atom from the starting material to install a new NCL bond. But the resurgence of interest was really focused on two things. It was focused on two major limitations in the reaction, namely that harsh conditions were being used generally to generate these nitrogen-centered radicals. And the community has identified better strategies that are more mild and allow for greater functional group tolerance. The other major focus was on new strategies to trap these carbon-centered radicals. Because if you could use an intermediate that was well understood in order to trap a variety of functional groups, you'd be able to, to generate a lot of diversity in the molecules, in the small molecule libraries you were accessing. So our thought looking at this 
was that we really wanted to focus on changing the position selectivity of this process. And there were some ways of thinking about it that were starting to emerge. So, oh, so at this point in time, David Nagib was starting to think about alcohol-derived imidates as precursors to nitrogen-centered radicals. And in this case, you would generate a nitrogen-centered radical that would go again through a six-membered ring transition state, but now to result in functionalization of a beta position relative to an alcohol derivative. We wanted to think about changing the transition state itself. And that was challenging because these are kinetically guided processes. But our thought was that perhaps we would be able to use a sulfamate ester, in this case, a dialkyl sulfamate ester as an appropriate precursor to a nitrogen centered radical. And in this case, the simplest way to go about this would be to have an N-chlorinated sulfamate ester, activate it with light, generating your nitrogen centered radical. We thought that perhaps because sulfamate esters incorporate elongated sulfur nitrogen and sulfur oxygen bonds, we would be able to have larger transition states be favored. In this case, we were hoping to favor a seven membered ring transition state. And then once the carbon centered radical would be generated, we in principle could intercept the whole variety of techniques that were out there. In this case, we were just thinking about chlorinating as a starting point. So where did this idea come from? I don't work in a vacuum, neither do you. Um, it turns out that Justin Dubois's lab had focused a lot of energy on intramolecular amination reactions. And they had looked at carbamates and realized that carbamates preferentially engage the beta position defined relative to the oxygen. And they were pretty surprised when they found that sulfamates preferentially engaged the gamma position defined relative to an alcohol and postulated that, that the basis for this change in selectivity was in fact the elongation of sulfur oxygen and sulfur nitrogen bonds. So building on that idea, we thought that perhaps we'd be able to make this concept work. There is a difference. It's not obvious that this change could enable a radical mediated process because of course, in the work from Justin Dubois lab, the intramolecular processes are thought to proceed through three centered transition states. And of course, what we were proposing was radically different. It was the use of seven membered ring transition states. It was also different in a minor way, namely that we were proposing use of an alkyl sulfamate ester in this process. And it turns out there weren't great ways to gain access to the types of starting materials we were proposing. So uh, we actually came up with a couple of preparations in order to pursue this research. Okay. With those methods in hand, it was time to think about whether we would be able to achieve our desired site selectivity. And in this case, we went with Occam's razor approach. We decided the simplest system was the best. If we started with an N-chlorinated starting material, which would be well-defined and only engaged in the presence of light and solvent, it would be hard to argue that this process was anything but radical mediated. And so we should be able to use the position selectivity of installation as an indicator of whether we were proceeding through this seven membered ring transition state. But there was a challenge, because there's always a challenge, which was that if you have a chlorination process in mind, there are also unguided chlorination processes that can complete. I'm going to describe these as processes that involve innate selectivity or rely on innate selectivity. In these types of reactions, generally speaking, if you have an alkyl chain and an electron withdrawing group, that electron withdrawing group is gonna pull density, electron density out of that alkyl chain, making it so that the most electron rich CH bond that has the lowest bond association is actually distal to that electron withdrawing group. And so that's gonna be the predominant site of functionalization. And this has been shown by many individuals. Here I'm simply showing an example from Eric Alexanian and Chris Vanderwaal's laboratories, um, which is a reagent driven example, but that relies on innate selectivity. And there's a challenge here, which is that even though that's the predominant product, you often get a mixture of products. And the reason you get a mixture of products is because 
uh, the reagent that you're using is an appropriate precursor to a nitrogen centered radical that's thermochemically capable of abstracting a CH bond at every site in this molecule. And of course, in other cases, although not in this one, you would also have a chlorine radical generated that is capable thermochemically of abstracting any of the CH bonds on this molecule. So in spite of the real promise of these technologies, one of the great challenges in terms of chlorination is simply that it's hard to achieve position selectivity given these other factors. So we chose to focus on a test substrate where we would have a more distal CH bond that would be more prone to innately selective processes and also incorporated the desired gamma functional, gamma CH bond, which is the desired site of functionalization. When you run this reaction in benzene, in light, you get a relatively clean food product that consists almost entirely of your desired gamma functionalized product and has a small amount of your delta fun functionalized material, which you can really only confirm by making an authentic standard of this delta functionalized material because it's so small, we've been unable to isolate it. We can, however, isolate without detectable amounts of delta functionalized product our gamma functionalized material in 98% yield. And that's the case regardless of the alkyl substituent we have on our sample made ester. We wanted to vary these substituents both to have control over the steric environment, but also to be able to change the pKa associated with the parent sulfur made esters. Um, in this case, we can vary it over three or so orders of magnitude and still see efficient chlorination. We don't see efficient chlorination when we have an N-aryl group. Um, so we don't use N-arylated sulfamate esters in these types of processes. You may notice that I'm using benzene and it turns out that benzene is a great solvent if you are trying to make claims about position selectivity in a process, but it's not a great solvent in terms of green chemistry. And so we can also carry out these reactions in trifluorotoluene or chlorobenzene, which are more green solvents, um, those reactions proceed in slightly lower yields because of competitive formation of a proto-dehalogenated material. The reason that we have chosen to report most of our results in benzene is so that we can make strong claims about selectivity. I'm not going to walk you through all of these claims, but I do want to point out one other example which is if we're using something like tetrahydrogeraniol derived sulfamate ester, then an unguided reaction would be expected to proceed at C7. This is a classic test substrate for neatly selective processes. And our guided process generates no detectable C7 functionalization, but only installs chlorine at C3. This is a pretty dramatic contrast if you're thinking about innately selected processes. We've got colleagues in the field who have generated really innovative approaches to installing fluorine or trifluoromethyl groups, um, amine or amide derivatives, azides and alcohols using unguided processes. And you could imagine a complementary approach to install each of these groups using this seven membered ring transition state per CH abstraction. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna tell you about this chlorination process. If you'd like to see a review on how broadly relevant this approach is, which also talks a little bit about other technologies that have been developed using this approach more recently, please see our Simlet accepted manuscript, which has uh, just been accepted. Um, I will make the following case, which is, that I'm talking here about an atom transfer process, the first exogenous atom transfer process demonstrated to occur with sulfamate ester directing group. But you can also carry out group transfer processes. And we demonstrated that using a xanthate ester. So xanthate esters have of course been popularized by Samir Zard um, and they've been demonstrated to engage in CH functionalization in some beautiful work by the Alexanian lab. So we were extending that research to demonstrate that they can engage in intramolecular xanthate transfer processes in a diastereoselective fashion with diastereoselectivity dictated by the complexity of the molecular scaffold you're installing it on. 
So here I'm showing an example where we're able to generate 76% yield of the major diastereomer of this xanthate ester product, which in principle could be carried on to a number of other products. Of course, if you can carry out chlorination, you wanna know that you can carry out fluorination. Um, those processes, the development of those processes is ongoing. In all of these cases, we had to install prior oxidation on the nitrogen of the sulfamate ester in order to get these reactions to be effective. But there is also a whole array of functional groups that can be installed using nitrogen centers that haven't been pre-oxidized. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about one of those processes focusing on this Gizé reaction. And I'm just gonna dig deep into a couple of points there related to position selectivity, namely the following. When we started this process, we wanted to make sure we had a simple alkyl chain that we were trying to functionalize in part because we didn't want to be taking advantage of some sort of thorpe ingold effect on that alkyl chain because we thought we would have greater breadth of relevance if we weren't. And in this case, we started with a relatively simple alkyl chain and we're thinking about this methylene center and using a photoredox mediated iridium catalyzed process, we were able to build on the work of Knowles and Rovis and install a new carbon carbon bond at this gamma position. But one of the things we didn't understand was in the case of a simple substrate like this with a distal tert-butyl group, why functionalization stopped at this monoalkylated product? Why were we able to generate 57% yield of a monoalkylated product and 28% yield of isolated recovered starting material without detecting any further alkylation? I.e., why were we able to have a tertiary center in the presence of a secondary center without seeing further reaction? because that tertiary center is weaker than the secondary center. And one hypothesis we came up with was, well, perhaps we had too bulky a substituent on the terminal end of this simple chain. And so we started sort of stripping back the chain. And in fact, that was the case. You can get to simple enough alkyl chains so that you can engage in bisalkylation independent of monoalkylation preferentially in the presence of an excess of trapping agent. But you have to have a really simple alkyl chain and a really simple trapping agent as soon as there's really very much steric encumbrance on either the trapping agent or your alkyl chain, you will stop once again at the monoalkylated product. And that's kind of cool because it means that you can engage this isostevial derivative, which we obtained by derivatizing stevia extract from whole foods. And you can obtain them in 58% yield with two to one DR, once again, having the diastereomeric ratio dictated by this um, small molecule. I think it's even cooler that you can take a small molecule such as this dehydroabitic acid derivative, which incorporates an electron rich aromatic ring, the type of ring that didn't tolerate our chlorine installation conditions and engage it efficiently in functionalization at a secondary center. This is pretty rare for a radical mediated directed process. So the other point I wanna make about photoredox catalysis, which I think most of our community has bought into is simply that because it is so mild, suddenly you can tolerate a lot more functionality. In this case, I'm showing really simple examples with a nitrile or an amide, but I think it, it speaks really well of the technology that we're able to engage a terminal alkyne, the appropriate precursor for an affinity probe in a directed reaction. Because you could imagine using this as a way to functionalize a lot of really complex natural products. Okay, one of the things we discovered in this process was that if we were using an electron deficient alkyne, we actually didn't vinylate at carbon. Instead, we engaged in vinylation at nitrogen. This was sort of a gift though because we were trying to have identify a strategy for cleaving this really sterically encumbered sulfamate ester. And what we discovered was without isolation of the intermediate, we could take our Gizé process and then run an end violational reaction and identify an excellent group for displacement. So not only could we recover 
upon displacement, an alcohol, like the alcohol in our initial starting material, making sort of a net four step process with three isolations to get these dysfunctionalized products. But we could also install an acetate or a thioacetate or an azide or an iodide. And this to us is pretty cool. Of course, what you might want in a directed functionalization process is one where you install the initial anchor to direct the group. In our case, you sulfamoylate. And then in, without intermediate purification, you functionalize and then cleave the sulfamate. That is if you just want to recover your original alcohol. And we're starting to develop that process. Specifically, we've identified conditions to cleave a sulfamate that give us back our alcohol in nearly quantitative yield. And we think these conditions or some that are similar may be compatible with a telescopic process, which will bring us down to thinking about potentially two-step reactions to install a broad range of functional groups. Okay. So I've told you about the platform to use alcohol derivatives in order to gamma functionalize. Hopefully I've convinced you that it's not only effective for installation of exogenous atom transfer reagents and group transfer reagents, but also for carbon-carbon bond formation. And we think that this has great opportunities. All of the chemistry I've shown you has been developed since actually April of 2017. So really relatively recently. It was all um, carried out by five graduate students and a postdoc, as well as three undergrads. So, so those are the only people who have advanced this chemistry in the talk. Uh, most of them have moved on or are about to. Of course, they were standing on the shoulders of group alums. Um, and so now we have a group that's turning over. We're happy to be supported and incredibly grateful to be supported by funding from Duke University. We appreciate the colleagues with whom we share space and analytical instrumentation. None of these projects would be possible without funding from the NIH. We are also fortunate to have funding for projects I didn't discuss from the ACSPRF, and we've had some collaborative funding from the ACSGCI. Um, and of course, because my graduate students are ambitious, they've gone out and secured their own funding as well. Thank you all for your attention. I will be happy to take any questions, and I do want to make one final pitch for the CCHF, which is that um, as a center, I think bringing these talks to fruition is a huge contribution to the community and pales in comparison with many of their other huge contributions to the community. So I'm happy to participate, honored to participate um, and grateful to them for what they've done for CH functionalization. Thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a wonderful talk. Um, it it's always amazes me how subtle chemistry is and uh, your insight into uh, changing positional selectivity by harnessing these wonderful subtleties and, and expanding that chemistry to be able to introduce all these different functionalities at these remote uh, conditions with exquisite control is, is really beautiful. So uh, thank you for joining us in your presentation and, and congratulations on some really beautiful chemistry. Um, uh, again, um, if people have questions, please don't hesitate to, 